So let's talk about Peter Keating. Part one of the book is named after Peter Keating. And there's a certain focus on Peter Keating in contrast to Howard Rourke throughout part one. Part one really shows their early careers in parallel. They both start out as students at the Stanton Institute of Technology. Keating is shown graduating with the highest honors. He's winning awards, he's you know the top student, everyone's there to see him graduate. Howard Rourke is expelled because he refuses to design the way his professors want him to design. They're both heading off to their first jobs in New York. Keating has got an offer from the most prestigious architecture firm in New York City. Howard Rourke has chosen to go look for a job with Henry Cameron, who basically everybody regards as a washed up has been, he used to be at the top architect in the country. Now he's you know a drunken has been that nobody wants to have anything to do with. They go off to New York and we see Keating gradually climbing his way up through the firm, achieving you know success after success, gradually building his way up to partner in the firm. Howard Rourke, struggles to find clients. He struggles to keep jobs. He gets fired from one firm after another. And as we move toward the end of part one, part one really ends in a sense with Peter Keating reaching a level of triumph in his career. He's won this prestigious Cosmo Slotnick architecture competition and he's been made a partner in his architecture firm. So he, by the end of part one, he's risen up through the ranks and achieved a certain pinnacle of success. Howard Rourke, on the other hand, by the end of part one, he's run out of money, he's run out of clients, he's run out of work. His last chance to keep his office open is the Manhattan Bank Building Commission. And he's asked to make some changes in the design and he refuses to preserve his artistic integrity, he loses the commission. And he basically chooses that he'd rather, you know, break rocks in a granite quarry than make a change to his design. So we see the parallel career of Rourke and Keating and how they take a different approach to their careers. And by the end of part one, it seems as though Keating is a triumphant success and Rourke is an absolute failure. If we look at how Peter Keating and Howard Rourke are portrayed in part one of the novel, there's a sense in which Rourke almost comes across as the completely unselfish man. He seems completely willing to sacrifice everything for the sake of his artistic integrity. And Peter Keating is portrayed as the paragon of selfishness in terms of the way that term is conventionally understood. He comes across as the selfish man in the way we normally think about selfishness. Now how do we see that? How is he portrayed? He comes across as somebody who's basically, he has no scruples in his career. He's basically willing to sort of trample on everybody in order to get what he wants. He's portrayed as displaying vanity and greed. He's incredibly ambitious to achieve fame and fortune as a, you know, famous person in the world. This is what he's after and he'll step on anybody he needs to in order to achieve that. So how do we see this? Let's look at the examples. You know, Peter Keating basically measures the steps in his career by the people he pushes out of the way. And you see this in his career at Franken and Higher. So the first step in his career is the draftsman Tim Davis. And what does Peter Keating do? He sort of takes over his work and makes him obsolete and eventually gets Tim Davis fired and he takes his job. The next step in his career is Claude Stengel, the chief designer. And Keating basically, he basically ends up double crossing Guy Franken, his boss, in order to create an opportunity for Claude Stengel to leave the firm, start out on his own, and opens up a vacancy for Peter Keating to take over as the chief designer. I mean, the worst instance that we see in his career is what he does to Guy Franken's partner, Lucius Heyer. So Lucius Heyer is, is sickly, he's had a stroke, everyone wants him to retire, and what does Peter Keating do? He's, he's, he doesn't think he's gonna get the partnership in the firm, he's desperate about this, 
and he desperately wants to become a partner in the firm. So what does he do? He basically tries to blackmail Lucius Heyer into retiring. And in the process of doing this, he basically precipitates a second stroke and kills the man. So, you know, these are the methods that he uses to advance in his career. He also has no scruples about taking other people's work and using it as his own. Howard Rourke designed all of his best projects at the Stanton Institute of Technology. Keating would go to him for help and Rourke would you know, help him with his designs, but what was really unique and original about the designs came from Rourke. That's true for the design for Keating's first building. When he takes over Claude Stengel's job and becomes the chief draftsman, he has his first opportunity to design a house for himself and he draws a complete blank. He goes to see Howard Rourke and Rourke helps him with the design. The Cosmo Slotnik building, this is this architectural competition that Keating wins and this propels him you know, to, to national fame and national attention as the winning designer of the Cosmo Slotnik building. Well, who designed the Cosmo Slotnik building? It's Howard Rourke designed. He was the one who came up with the ingenious plan. So Keating has no scruples about, you know, taking over Howard Rourke's designs and presenting them as his own. If you look at Keating's love life, you get a glimpse also into what we would normally think of as a sort of conventionally selfish man. He loves Catherine Halsey, Katie, but he has no scruples about just dumping her in order to pursue Dominique Franken that he can parade around as this incredible trophy wife. And later on in the novel, when we get to part three, we see that he has no scruples about in effect, prostituting Dominique to Gail Wynand in exchange for a really important architectural commission. So if we look at Peter Keating, he basically comes across as the paragon of the selfish man who pursues what he wants in life through completely unscrupulous methods, scheming, manipulating, and just stepping on anybody to get what he wants. So Peter Keating comes across as our conventional image of what a selfish person is and, and the idea that you have to have this kind of ugly form of selfishness in order to get ahead, in order to succeed. Part one portrays him, you know, backstabbing, manipulating, scheming, trampling on other people to get what he wants. And it seems to show that he actually succeeds at this. By the end of part one, he comes across, you know, he reaches the top, he reaches what he's after in this section of the novel. He's, he achieves his partnership with the firm. He wins the Cosmoslotnik competition. And he himself thinks of what he's done as, you know, being in the name of selfishness or it's a form of selfishness. After he, this incident where he goads Lucius Heyer into his fatal stroke, he basically drinks himself into a stupor and he thinks to himself, well, we see what he thinks of himself with the following quotation. He told himself that he had nothing to regret. He had done what anyone would have done. Catherine had said it. He was selfish. Everybody was selfish. It was not a pretty thing to be selfish, but he was not alone in it. So this is the idea that there's a certain cynical view that selfishness is ugly and immoral, but it's the only way to get ahead in life. If you want to achieve success, you've got to trample on other people and behave in this manipulating, uh, selfish in the conventional way we think of it, way. And if the novel were to end at the end of part one, it would almost seem like an affirmation of this view of selfishness. Howard Rourke has almost selflessly sacrificed for the sake of his art, and he's drummed out of the profession and he's headed off to a granite quarry to work as a laborer. Peter Keating has behaved in this conventionally selfish way, and he's achieved everything he wanted to at the first stage of his career. So if the novel were to end at the end of part one, it would seem to be affirming that this is what selfishness is, and this is what's required if you want to have success in life. But of course the novel doesn't end at the end of part one. And what we see in the rest of the novel is the real meaning of Keating's actions, what he's really after. We see the real meaning of Howard Rourke's actions and we get a completely opposite view of the meaning of selfishness and selflessness.
Already in part one, though, we can see that there's something wrong with the idea of thinking of Peter Keating as a selfish person. Right from the beginning, right when we first meet him, we see that there, there's a certain way in which he's not, not really selfish, not selfish in the way that Howard Rourke comes across as selfish, that there's something a little off here. There's a certain sense in which we see that Keating, even though he's portrayed as being selfish in this conventional way, the scheming manipulator who steps on other people, in another respect, there's a definite sense that we get right from the beginning that he kind of lacks a self, that he doesn't have a strong personality, strong personal values or desires, that he lacks an independent mind. And we see this right from the beginning. Why is he even in architecture? I mean, we find out that he's in architecture basically because his mother pushed him into the profession. He wanted to be an artist, but architecture is a much more respectable profession, so he gets pushed into architecture. Why does he work so hard to be the top student at Stanton? Is it because he has a passion for the work of architecture? Well, what he is really interested in is beating other people. He can't bear the idea that somebody's better than him. So he needs to be on top because he has a desire to be better than other people. And there's a quotation when he's sitting in his graduation ceremony, he's thinking about the fact that he came out on top and this is what he thinks to himself. He would always beat Schlinker and all the Schlinkers of the world. He would let no one achieve what he could not achieve. Let them all watch him. He would give them good reason to stare. He felt the hot breaths about him and the expectation like a tonic. It was wonderful, thought Peter Keating, to be alive. So Keating feels like it's wonderful to be alive because he's sitting in a hall full of people who are there to see him graduate as the top student after he beat another person. That's what makes him feel wonderful to be alive. It's not the work of architecture itself, it's the success in the eyes of others. And this is what we see really defines Peter Keating. He wants to be great in the eyes of others. He wants to be a success in the eyes of others. He doesn't have any sort of independent creative drive of his own. What he wants is to be a success in architecture in the eyes of others and for other people to view him as a great successful architect. You know, we see this in the manner in which he carries out his profession when he's working for Franken and Heyer, when he's working as an architect, how does he go about doing his work? Well, he does basically what everyone else in his profession does. He copies the great designs of the past. He copies styles of others. You know, he designs classical buildings, Renaissance buildings, Gothic buildings. There's no such thing as a Peter Keating building. There's, you know, buildings that look like copies of designs of the past. You know, he learns from his mentor, Guy Franken, that the real work in an architectural office is not done by the people who smudge away on the drafting tables. You know, that's the necessary evil. You have to do that in order to have an architecture. The real work, he learns, is done outside of the office, schmoozing the clients at the parties. You know, it's the social networking and the connections and the pull peddling and the schmoozing. That's the real work of the architectural office. Howard Rourke, you know, he says that he doesn't intend to build in order to have clients. He intends to have clients in order to build. Well, for Peter Keating, it's exactly the opposite. He intends to build in order to have clients. And this is his whole approach. This is his whole methodology. So even in part one, you know, we can see that there's a certain lack of self that's present here. What he's after is not a great personal desire of his own that he wants to become an architect because he loves the work and has a passion for doing it. He wants to become an architect so that he can achieve fame, fortune, admiration, all these things that come from success in the eyes of other people. So by conventional standards, Keating is portrayed as coming across as selfish in the sense that he'll step on other people to get what he wants. But when we look a little closer, we see if you look more closely at what he wants, that's where we see his fundamental and essential lack of self. He doesn't really want anything in the sense of having a independent, first-hand personal desire or value. What we see when we look at the character of Peter Keating is somebody who fundamentally lacks a self. 
when he pursues fame, it's fame in the eyes of others. He wants to be admired by other people. He wants to be wealthy. Why? So he can impress other people. Everything that he wants in life is a reflection of other people, and that's the sense in which he really lacks a self. In planning the novel, Ayn Rand made notes about all of her characters, and she has a, a description of Peter Keating that is especially relevant here. Uh, I'm going to read a quotation from Ayn Rand's journals from her notes in planning the character of Peter Keating. His spirit is an empty space which other men have to fill. In himself alone, he has nothing to offer, to himself or to the world. He cannot exist save through others. His consuming ambition is to be great in other people's eyes. Thus, at the root of his spirit, others take precedence over his own self. Others establish all his values. Others become the motive power of his will to live. To Keating, all reality is secondhand through others, by others, for others. Fame above all else is his greatest desire. The admiration of others for his person is his greatest need. His life is an eternal concern with what others will think, what others will say, how others will react to him. And we see, even at the end of part one, which in one respect seems to show that he's reached a triumphant success. If we look a little more closely, we see that in reality, none of this apparent success has actually brought him any personal fulfillment or happiness. He knows that he's achieved the status of partner in the firm through this process of backstabbing him and manipulation. And, you know, he feels guilt over the fact that he practically murdered uh, Guy Franken's partner, precipitating the stroke. Into, and this was how he achieved the partnership. He also knows he's the, he's the great famous architect who won the Cosmo Slotny competition, but he knows that he didn't design that building. So any admiration or success that he, that he feels or that he revels in, at the back of it all, he knows that it's undeserved and that he didn't really earn that. So Peter Keating goes after everything he thinks he wants in life, and he achieves it. And what we see is that it doesn't bring him any kind of happiness or fulfillment. And I think the scene that brings this out the most and really shows the essence of Peter Keating is the scene that occurs in part three of the book in chapter two, chapter two, part three. This is a scene where Keating is at home with Dominique Franken, who he's now married, so he's achieved this success of marrying Dominique as the great trophy wife, and he's sitting at home with her, and they're talking, and at this point in the novel, he's really reached the pinnacle of his career. He's sort of renowned as the great architect in the country, and he's achieved wealth, he's achieved fame, he's achieved fortune, and he's sitting at home with Dominique, reflecting on all of this, and what we see in this scene is both the apparent success, but at the same time, the absolutely total spiritual emptiness that he embodies. And he's sitting at home, this is what he's thinking to himself. He stared into the fire. That was what made a man happy, to sit looking dreamily into a fire, at his own hearth in his own home. That's what he had always heard and read. He stared at the flames unblinking, to force himself into a complete obedience to an established truth. Just one more minute of it and I will feel happy, he thought, concentrating. Nothing happened. He thought of how convincingly he could describe this scene to friends and make them envy the fullness of his contentment. Why couldn't he convince himself? He had everything he'd ever wanted. He had wanted superiority. And for the last year, he had been the undisputed leader of his profession. He had wanted fame, and he had five thick albums of clippings. He had wanted wealth, and he had enough to ensure luxury for the rest of his life. He had everything anyone ever wanted. How many people struggled and suffered to achieve what he had achieved? How many dreamed and bled and died for this without reaching it? Peter Keating is the luckiest fellow on earth. 
How often had he heard that? This last year had been the best of his life. He had added the impossible to his possessions, Dominique Franken. It had been such a joy to laugh casually when friends repeated to him, Peter, how did you ever do it? It had been such a pleasure to introduce her to strangers, to say lightly, my wife, and to watch the stupid, uncontrolled look of envy in their eyes. Once at a large party, an elegant drunk had asked him, with a wink declaring unmistakable intentions, Say, do you know that gorgeous creature over there? Slightly, Keating had answered, gratified, she's my wife. So Keating is sitting at home with Dominique, thinking he's the luckiest fellow on earth and feeling nothing. Now, in the course of their marriage, Dominique has acted as a kind of mirror to Keating's lack of self. She hasn't asserted any values of her own. She hasn't asserted any opinions of her own. She hasn't even, as he puts it, he hasn't even, she hasn't even changed the blinds in the living room. And he's starting to notice this and it's starting to bother him. And they're having a conversation and the conversation really brings out these facts about Peter Keating, this lack of self. So he wants to tell Dominique that she's beautiful. So he says, you know, Ellsworth Toohey said this about you, and Gordon Prescott said this about you, and she says, and Ralston Holcomb? She's sort of goading him a little bit and underscoring the fact that he has no opinions of his own. He says to her that he has an idea, something he'd like to do. He thought of it all by himself. This didn't come from anyone else. He wants to move out to the country. Oh, she says, do you want to design a country home for us? Oh, no, you know, someone, Bennett and the firm will dash off that. He's a whiz at all the country homes. You know, are you going to enjoy commuting? Oh, no, what a headache that'll be. You know, are you going to enjoy gardening? No, what are you kidding me? We'll be able to afford a gardener. You know, are you going to like the country? Are you going to enjoy the nature? No, you know, who enjoys that? So every, every possible reason for wanting to have a home in the country, he dismisses. It's not, it's not really interesting. What comes out in the conversation? Why does he want a home in the country? Well, it turns out that Claude Stengel has just built a home in Westchester. And who's Claude Stengel to have a country home before Peter Keating does? So they're having this conversation, and every element of the scene shows how Peter Keating lacks any self. He lacks any opinions. He lacks any independent judgment. He lacks any values. And he is trying to complain to Dominique that she hasn't brought any of herself to the marriage, that she hasn't brought her own opinions, that she hasn't expressed any views about what she wants to do. And Keating says to her, Dominique, where's your eye? And she says, where's yours, Peter? And that right there sums up the essence of Peter Keating. He's somebody who fundamentally lacks a self. He lacks an eye. And that line, in a certain sense, is a kind of obituary on Peter Keating. So let's talk about Cortland Holmes. What's the significance of Cortland Holmes for the character of Peter Keating? Well, by the end of the novel, Keating has slipped as an architect. You know, we saw him at the, at the height of his success with Dominique Franken, uh, top architect in the country, married to Dominique Franken. And that was the pinnacle of his success. But there was never any reason why he was perceived as the greatest architect in the country. And from that pinnacle, he starts to decline. Cortland Holmes for Peter Keating represents his last chance to maintain the illusion of his great success as an architect. He knows he's slipped, he knows he's failing, he knows that he hasn't got the prominence that he once had, and he goes after Cortland Holmes in the same way that he went after all of his other great successes. He knows that he doesn't have the creative drive to earn great success as an architect, and he knows that his best designs have always come from Howard Rourke. So he pursues the Cortland Holmes Commission in the same way that he pursued all of his other best work. He has Rourke do the design for him. And the arrangement that they have is that Rourke agrees to design the building as long as the project is built as he designed it. Keating is going to get all the fame, all the money, etc. His sole role is to ensure that the building is built as designed. And even at that, he fails utterly. 
There's nothing he can do to stop all the forces at work that lead the design to be corrupted and destroyed by all the people in the government project that are involved in building Cortland Homes. So even the one thing that he has to do in order to you know, make this arrangement work, he can't even do that. And the last time we see Peter Keating, he's on the witness stand at the trial. And the way it's described is this is supposed to be a sensation. This is, you know, a great architect, one of the greatest architects in the country is basically confessing his incompetence and admitting that Howard Rourke was the one who designed the housing project. But he's so spiritually empty, he's so empty as a human being that even this, what's supposed to be a dramatic issue that comes out in the trial, even that comes out completely flat. And the way he's described at the end of all of this really is sort of the last word on Peter Keating. And this is the way Ayn Rand describes it in the novel. When Keating left the stand, the audience had the odd impression that no change had occurred in the act of a man's exit, as if no person had walked out.